Greetings adventurers and welcome to Luke Alba Marketplace. The hardest part about playing D&D is finding and keeping the group. The final boss of every campaign tends to be schedule issues more than whoever the DM spends countless hours on building up as the big bad. The only guaranteed way to get a group together is to become the DM yourself, but there is a good chance that you'll never get to be a player again. The good news is that you'll get to play hundreds of characters you've been saving for your next campaign, but you'll run the risk of the party memeing and killing them within minutes of them being introduced. In this story, we're going to be hearing about the experience of someone who tried to be a player and has ultimately switched to DM and he has one small request. Please don't read the module. Chris, on the other hand, the problem player of the story has another idea. Part one is first time DM discovers player cheating. Player rage quits after DM tweaks encounter. This post contains spoilers for the Lost Minds of Phandelver, got into the hobby a few years ago. No IRL friends, so used Roll20 and LFG groups to find games. Had several rough experiences as a player that should be posted here and ultimately decided to Dungeon Master the 5th edition starter set for a group of randos myself. Posted looking for group with the only requirement that players have neither read nor played through the starter set. The game starts off well enough, everyone gets along, no one has played the starter set, and players are all new to the game and character creation goes well. Group consisted of me, the Dungeon Master, a two-pack of friends who knew each other IRL, Adam and Barry being the rogue and druid respectively, Deb is an awkward Canadian female monk, and the cheater Chris, who rolls a variant human paladin with polearm master feet at level 1. Very optimized, very cool. Early on, it's clear Chris is trying to break the game. Instead of following the trail of goblin tracks to rescue their NPC employer, he pushes for them to go to town first. Doesn't take no for an answer, so the party continues to town to deliver the cart of goods. Town is beset by brigands, and the NPCs express concern since their employer was supposed to arrive in town a day ahead of the party. I'm trying to push them back on track without railroading them, but Chris wants to fight the brigands instead. Encounter with bad guys goes as expected for a level 1 party. All but Chris get dropped by multi-attacks. Had a plan that they get captured should TPK occur, but Chris uses Polar Master plus plus to one-shot the remaining baddies. The group recovers and decides that they should go back to try and find their employer. Campaign proceeds, but I start to notice that Chris seems to know exactly what checks to make to avoid all traps, he knows a shortcut to the boss, etc. He plays it off like they're lucky guesses, but his lucky guesses begin to border on clairvoyance. A couple weeks pass and Adam and Barry complain to me that the game feels like the Chris show. I talk to Chris and ask that he'd be conscious of how he's playing to allow others to do their thing sometimes. He apologizes to the group in the next session and passively aggressively states how he'll play his character less optimally so other players can have their fun. Brick. Everyone else at the table starts having a lot of fun, except whenever the players are about to execute a plan that may trigger an ambush or a trap or be slightly less than a perfect playthrough, Chris would be like, are you sure you want to do that? It's at this point that Chris's clairvoyance gets passed on to Deb and also at this point where it's revealed that Chris and Deb are now an item both in and out of game. At one point, Deb asks to look for secret doors and to avoid metagaming after failed checks I roll behind the screen. I tell her that while her search is thorough, it's just a normal wall. Now this spot happens to be exactly where the leader of the hideout secret escape route leads. Chris decides to leave a bear trap and some ball bearing there anyways. Very lucky guess. I started to suspect that Chris had read or is reading the published module to get ahead. To confirm my suspicions, I decided to tweak encounters. The game becomes a lot of work to prepare, but it's fun to watch Chris get increasingly frustrated as he expends resources to avoid things that aren't there and gets surprised by new stuff. This gets us to an encounter with a banshee. In the published module, the encounter is purely RP to avoid a TPK at level 3 with her whale. They have to flatter her to convince her to share information that they need. I tweaked it so they had to wait for the banshee to show up with a trap in the form of a bejeweled jewelry case which is locked. Chris seems confused by the setup and keeps saying she should be here though. Adam the Rogue decides the temptation is too great and tries to pick the lock on the case. Success. They cheer. He opens it to reveal that there was a music box with the effect of her wail inside, but only Adam can hear it. Adam fails and drops a zero. She shows up pissed. They're extremely unlikely to get the information they need from her now. Adam is dying, so we roll initiative to follow a turn order during this mostly RP encounter. I explain to the party that she doesn't seem to want to fight and seems embarrassed by her own appearance. I suggest that someone should stabilize Adam while others can attempt to convince her to give the information. Chris is pissed and keeps saying this isn't how it goes over and over. I know for sure now that he's been reading the module. On his turn, I remind them that Adam needs healing and they are still there to convince her to give them information. 
Instead, he finally quits trying to play everything optimally and just tries to smite her. Everyone else playing groans at his decision. With his Polar Master, Smite, and some inspiration, he comes close to one-shotting the Banshee at level 3. The Banshee wails for real this time, no one saves. I have them roll death saves, which they all make, so they're just unconscious as a party in the Banshee's den. The Banshee retreated in shame at her own wretched existence. Chris is livid. He goes off about how overpowered Banshees are and how that's why the writers of the module made it so that she wouldn't use her whale. I said, how would you even know that without cheating? He disconnects right there. Sends me a message over Discord admitting that he's read the module adventure, but that the game just isn't fun for him and he resigns. I wish I could say that this is where it ends, but two weeks later, Deb begged me to let him come back to apologize and keep playing. We were also having trouble finding a fourth player and Adam and Barry just wanted to keep the game going, so the saga continued. I actually don't have a problem with someone trying to play a powerful character that's min-max to whatever the campaign needs. Like for example, if you're having a homebrew campaign and the Dungeon Master shares with you that there's going to be a lot of undead in it, it's not weird for you to pick either a ranger that has that as a favored foe, or you know, maybe you just want to play a cleric because you know you have a lot of tools, you have turn undead, you know that your magic is going to go very far in these kinds of campaigns. The problem comes when the module has specific sequences of actions that are taken, and since you've read it ahead of time, you're acting like a rules lawyer saying, hey DM, you don't get to make a decision here. The DM has ultimate say, even in modules. The modules are just trying to keep them on track. And now let's see part two, which is called First Time DM Catches Cheater by Tweaking Details a Published Module, Player Raids Quits, Again. So Cheater Chris comes back to play the game, partially because Deb begs me and partially because we have a hard time finding a fork to play with us. I was desperate not to let my campaign fail, and I foolishly thought letting him back in was the best option. Chris assured the group that he was no longer reading ahead and could only vaguely remember details of what was to come. I decided not to take his word for it and continued to tweak things, sometimes by just a little bit, but more often by a lot. And I think that's smart that he's going to keep tweaking things. One of the reasons I ran the module was because I didn't have a ton of time to prep in my life. Countering his cheating meant more time prepping and DMing was gradually becoming more of a burden. But at the same time, I was really enjoying the creative outlet. The campaign continues. Chris is more careful, letting himself fail at things occasionally, but whenever it really matters, he always miraculously knows exactly what's going to happen next. The RP between Deb and Chris is getting weird too, but mostly just awkward and not inappropriate yet. That's part three. Adam and Barry are bros and doing a great job keeping things light and fun while improving their roleplay skills a lot. The group has finally saved their employer and triumphantly made it back to town. It seemed that all that was left was taking the Lost Mine itself and the mysterious villain of the campaign, the Black Spider. In the first part, I mentioned how Chris pushed the party in the first session to go to Phandalin rather than follow the clear clues of the goblin kidnapping. When it came out that he cheated, Chris sort of bragged one session that he tried that because when he read ahead, he thought the goblin cave was boring and wanted to see if he could skip it. The F? This is where I made the biggest tweak in the adventure. When they got their NPC employer back to town, they were all met with distrust and derision rather than a hero's welcome. See, I had decided that, as a consequence of Chris's effort at the beginning of the campaign, that the real Sildar had been killed due to their delay and one of the Black Spider's doppelgangers took his place with the goal of 1. Investigating whether the player's employer had told anyone else the location of the mine, and 2. Consolidating the spider's hold on Phandalin by taking over as Sildar. This included poisoning the town against the adventurers while they were out adventuring. Thus, they were met by an antagonistic new town master in Sildar, backed up by a militia that was a mix of former red brands and local townsfolk. The next couple sessions, Chris was extraordinarily silent at the table. It was as if he utterly lacked all creativity now that we were completely off book. All he could suggest was murder hoboing his way through. When that didn't work, he tried to bully the group into leaving the town straight for the mine despite Gundren himself saying this was more important. The other three didn't bite. They investigated Sildar and learned he was fake. They made a deal with the Zents to run the remaining red brands out of town, which meant the Zents gained partial control of the town. They won the favor of the town by exposing Zildar as a fake, the session climax with fake Zildar taking a halfling kid NPC hostage and fleeing to a cave with a passage to the Underdark. Chris is bitching throughout, mostly because he wasted his smites slaying some mooks and wouldn't give them a long rest because they have to save the kid. But there was once where he says, this isn't right. The showdown with fake Zildar was rad. At first, Zildar pretended to be the kid and they couldn't tell which was real. Barry the Druid used his last spell slot on Moonbeam, desperate the fake Zildar grappled the 
kid and threatened to throw him into a seemingly bottomless pit if they didn't let him go. It's Chris's turn. He starts crying. Like, really ugly, full-grown ass man crying. Awkward. He's so upset yet totally paralyzed about what to do, he passes his turn. The party eventually decides to let the guy go to save the kid. Session over, Adam and Barry are raving about how much fun the session was. Deb is hyped too. That's when Chris goes off about how he feels like I'm effing with him now because he's cheated way back then. He tells the group that the session triggered his anxiety because he didn't know that was going to happen next and begged me and the group to let the game get back on track. I was pretty shitty to him in response, calling him a bitch and suggested he should just quit if the game stressed him out that much. He disconnected. This was followed by a letter to the group about how hurt he was, by signaling him out, by changing the module, and telling a whole long sob story about his life and how D&D is one of his few escapes and he needs to feel in control of his shitty life. I was ready to write him off then and there, but no one wanted to play without him and I was too much of a pushover at that point in my life to not cut it off. So I let him come back, which was what led to part three, where the game finally came tumbling down. So Chris plays the victim here a little bit. He says that he has to read the module, even though he said he wasn't going to and hasn't anymore, because, you know, it gives him anxiety to not know what happens next. People replay modules all the time, knowing what mostly is going to happen, and they just test out new characters, you know, they try to RP it a little bit different and have some fun with the variety. Not every module is ran the same way every time. But since they have a literal meltdown whenever things don't go exactly their way as they planned it, I don't know if it's their anxiety as much as they're a control freak. Let's see what happens in part three. Chris the Cheater and the Meltdown of Bryn Shender. So this post has spoilers from the 5th edition starter set and a little bit of Storm King's Thunder. Chris rejoins after his sob story and at the behest of the other players who just want to play D&D. All that's left is the secret mind that constitutes the finale. The party spends the first session preparing for the trip and this is where I encounter the first red flag and the first signs Chris didn't give an F and felt like his cheating was now condoned. As part of the prep, Chris makes a point of buying holy water because you never know when you might need it. Yes you do Chris, you know exactly exactly what that's for. It was at this point too that Chris and Deb's characters hook up in game. At the beginning of the campaign, I said I didn't want to play through explicit stuff and everyone agreed. But now they were role playing their characters, admitting their love for each other, and then started awkwardly narrating their resulting PDA. Chris says, I take her to our room in the inn and remove her monk robes. I cut it off and said, let's just cut the black here. Your character shared a room at the inn and we can leave the rest of the imagination. Chris is miffed as is Deb. Adam and Barry both remind them of what we all agreed on in session zero. I don't get why in so many of these stories, people like force ERP into a campaign that just begs you to not. I'm sure there's some very spicy forums you guys can go on and have everyone watch you guys RP. I run the mine pretty much by the book because I didn't have a whole lot of free time for prep and because Storm King's Thunder just came out and I had plans to transition from Lost Mine to that module while pretending like I was homebrewing. I figured the adventure would be too new for Chris to cheat with and was an open enough sandbox to make his cheating not really matter anyways. In the mine, it becomes the Deb and Chris show. They both know exactly when and where the enemies are, where to look for loot, etc. Adam and Barry are getting frustrated. They end up having to take a long rest in the mine. The party locks down a room with some pistons wedged under the doors. Good idea, Barry. On Chris's watch, he decides he wants to narrate slipping to Deb's bedroll. I tell him no. He keeps going. I throw a roaming pack of ghouls at them who barge through the door. Chris is mad because presumably Deb's passive perception should have been high enough to have heard them coming. Not when she's occupied with you trying to slip it in, dude. At the end of the day, with no resources, it's a tough fight and Deb goes down and fails two death saves before they can help. The couple is mad because I'd interrupted virtual tabletop sexy times. Barry is mad because his really good idea of locking down the room didn't work. Yeah, sorry Barry. The only other highlight from the mine was the flame skull. Remember the holy water Chris bought? It was for this. It was a tough fight, and Chris wanted to avoid it altogether, but Adam and Barry would sometimes face roll room just that with Chris. They made it through, then Chris dumped the holy water on the flame skull's remains, just in case. My eyes rolled out of my head at this point, but I was just going to bear it until Storm King's Thunder. Starter set ends. They get some downtime, squad is level 5, so we're starting chapter 3 of Storm King's Thunder. 
SKT has three ways to run the initial call to the action encounter. Each one puts the players in a different town of the Sword Coast, and the encounters are very different. I don't tell them we're running the module, I just give them a quest to get their asses up to the city in the north called Bryn Shander. I'm preparing the Bryn Shander encounter and see Chris and Deb are logged into the game in Roll20. They keep making rolls while I'm trying to prepare so I jump into Discord to ask them to clear out for a bit or to see if they need help with something. They were acting out the scenes I wouldn't let them have and didn't notice me enter the chat so I had to clear my throat and they both disconnected. I sent them both messages that whatever they do on their own time is whatever, but they need to use personal voice chat for that. No response. Yeah, did they really have to do that in the public? I think they like people watching. The party makes its way to Bren Shonder. With random encounters, Chris doesn't have much to work with, but he was damn sure to know exactly what each enemy's weaknesses were, as well as their HP. Second guessing by math when he expected the enemy to be bloodied. The encounter in Bryn Shounder consists of a massive ice giant attack. The players take control of NPCs around the town in addition to their characters. If the NPCs survive, they'll be rewarded with a quest from that NPC. The group had met some of the NPCs already, but this encounter was how I was introducing others to the party. I drew a giant non-contiguous map of sections of the town to scale down the three or four separate encounters across the city and gave NPC stat blocks to each player. Chris insisted on a particular NPC which was a red flag that maybe I hadn't been crafty enough pretending like I was homebrewing. Like he really wanted that NPC's quest in particular. I don't even remember what it was but at the time it stood out as an indication that my attempts to shake his cheating had failed. Either way the battle ensues and Chris is trying to keep his NPC out of danger but the encounters were set up to be dangerous. A giant boulder hit NPC Chris and he goes down. No one around has healing and all the medicine checks to stabilize fail. Adam's NPC dies too, but they win the battle and drive off the giants. Chris is clearly upset his NPC died. Tries to argue that he should be able to bring the NPC back, etc. I tell him them's the breaks, no resurrection, no retcons. He then has the balls to complain about my choice of town for the first attack. He had apparently read the new adventure module and was hoping I would take them to one of the other towns to start the module instead. Specifically Tribor because it was more interesting. I call him a piece of shit cheater and ask that he leave the game. He says he quits because I wouldn't give him enough RP time with Deb. He and Deb disconnect, Chris left me a message the next day cataloging all of his beefs with my DM style and how I need to find a new hobby. Adam and Barry aren't mad at the cheating because after all, even with the cheating we almost died a bunch of times. They resigned from the game because they didn't feel like finding two new players and wanted it to end at the end of the starter set in the first place. So just like that, the game fizzled out. The story does have a happy ending, I took about a year off DMing after that and then found a new group to DM through Tomb of Annihilation. We played every week for a year straight and and they got through the whole thing. It was epic, fun, and super rewarding. F you, Chris. What is it with these stories having ERP that these players just have to have the rest of the party watch? Just leave the rest of the party alone. They want to roll dice and punch goblins. And Chris is clearly playing victim here. It just occurred to me that if he truly is super anxious and wants to feel in control of his life and d and is the way to do it, maybe he should be a dungeon master. Now, unfortunately, it's probably going to be one of those dungeon masters that has a meltdown when the players want to get off his railroads and he'll act like it's the worst thing ever. So maybe that's a bad idea, too. Don't feel bad about kicking him. There's a saying that no D&D is better than bad D&D. Every week you wasted on this campaign that clearly couldn't be salvaged. It's just one more week. It's going to take you to find that perfect D&D group. And thank you all for stopping by. Make sure to like and subscribe to the video. It really helps grow the channel. As well as thank you to the YouTube and Patreon members who make this possible. I'll see you in the next video. Farewell for now.